Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the latest edition of Automatica Talks, a series in which we examine current technical and societal topics for automation and robotics users worldwide. Today, we'll focus on the key topic of workplace skills with a topic called Next Generation Workforce Upskilling for Robotics. Susanna Beeler from the International Federation of Robotics will introduce the topic and the speakers in a few seconds. Susanna is General Secretary of the International Federation of Robotics. Susanna, over to you. A warm welcome also on behalf of the IFR to this IFR Executive Roundtable on upskilling the workforce and um, the next generation workforce. IFR has published a positioning paper um, yesterday, actually, just in time for this roundtable. It, it's um, on the topic of next generation skills, enabling today's and tomorrow's workforce to benefit from automation. You can download this positioning paper for free from the IFR website. Yeah, and I'm happy that we um, could gather a good panel, a great panel to discuss the issues of uh, next generation workforce and upskilling. So now I hand over back to Ken Pui to start the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to meet all of you. And I look forward to our discussion on next generation workforce upskilling for robotics. Uh, what, what impact will automation have on the skills requirements of the current and the next generation workforce? But what we definitely see, and this is just to confirm, is a spread and an increase in both process and product innovation in recent years across sectors. Definitely a spike in the agricultural sector, a continuous rise in manufacturing, obviously, but also across sectors. And we see that emerging as a greater challenge in terms of both upskilling and reskilling, but also in terms of obviously automation and employment impact on it. Um, what we see also is that it depends what kind of production and automation it is and what kind of product inputs are being used together with the different robotic systems since that affects the labor input and it affects the skilling and upskilling needs so i thought that's also important to to mention and it also relates to the fact how these systems are being implemented at the firm level is also important to consider in our discussion today. That's not, that's an important topic because um, what we'll, we'll talk about today is that in manufacturing, there are certainly so many tasks that people, only people can do that uh, that can't, can't be automated or easily automated or it's better for a person to do. Um, and so from a, from a labor standpoint in a factory, you have operations that are still dedicated for people. And so from a labor component, it's important to understand that within a manufacturing sector, you're going to still have human uh, operations that need to be done, but then you have a level of workers that need to um, still then program and maintain and, and operate the automation itself. So it really does have two sides, as you mentioned. What, what skills will be particularly important now for, for the workforce? I think, um, first of all, in terms of uh, the willingness and the motivation to upskill, reskill, and the incentives to do so, they, they, they are very much correlated because many low-skilled or even middle-skilled workers who are very much affected by the introduction of industrial robotics, AI systems, IoT, whatever it is, um, all are not used to, first of all, obtain too much training during their working lives traditionally. That's mm -hmm. the first. So there is already a cultural sort of, um, I don't know, framework that does not necessarily, that is not necessarily inviting to, uh, up to well, to retrain. So here you don't have, uh, in all countries at least, in all OECD countries, you do not have the financial incentives. You do not necessarily have the right to take time for training unless your employer encourages you to. If you, as yourself, as the employee, say, I would like to obtain more uh, non-routine skills so that I can operate your new machine that you put in the production line, um, if your employer doesn't say yes to that, you cannot take the risk of taking a training outside of your workplace. I think that's 
a problem. A problem is also that most OECD countries, at least, and beyond the OECD, do not have dual VAT systems. And dual VAT systems, obviously, um, are more, um, um, well, more prone to uh, be able to well, serve as uh, training uh, grounds and uh, fertilizing grounds to develop new skills. And in terms of social partners, we can just see that there is a correlation be, be, between uh, collective bargaining coverage and the willingness of employers to invest in training. So for me, it's not necessarily a matter of the technology producers who provide the technology of being responsible for providing the training. For me, it is about the employers are working with trade unions, workers' representatives to encourage more uptake to make sure the financing mechanisms are there and the time for training is there. This is very broad, what I just said, but I don't want to take up too much time answering that question. We are, we are exploring at European level the, the idea of individual learning accounts and accounts is also meant in the financial sense. Uh, but we are just exploring. But in fact, in France, and, and you are based in France, they have that already. I'd like to bring Mike and Jeff into the, the discussion on this. Um, you're coming at it from the other side. You're the technology provider. Um, what what can you do to ensure that people aren't left behind? Um, or what do you actively do? I know, obviously, at Fanuc, you have a lot of in Japan, a lot of courses for your own people, but what do you do for your customers? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So maybe first and foremost, I think one of the challenges that everyone faces when we talk about upskilling labor when it, in terms of automation is there's this mindset that um, robots are really hard and technologically, technologically advanced. And so taking a low skilled person and upskilling them into robotics seems like this major jump of, of skill. And I think it's important to understand that uh, upskilling labor, um, even low skilled labor, upskilling that into this business, there's many, many levels uh, that you can take. So you can take a low skilled labor and upskill them into, say, a general operator's role where that person just needs to follow a certain easy set of guidelines to ensure that the system that they're presented continues to run. You can upskill that further into a maintenance role. You can upskill that further into a uh, programming um, role or a further maintenance role. And so um, I think that there's a general fear in the marketplace because people talk about robots and automation and you typically see somebody with a lab coat on and uh, you know pushing buttons and seem, seeming really smart, but uh, there's a lot of different levels in which to upskill. So right off the bat, I think that's important. Um, you can see here, I'm sitting in one of our training uh, rooms, and I'm actually in one of our smaller ones because a lot of the larger ones are filled right now, uh, trying to space people out. So we're actually currently training uh, many, many people here. Uh, I'm in America. I'm in, I'm in Detroit uh, uh, currently. Um, but as you mentioned, Ken, FANUC trains uh, our people all over the world. Um, both Felix and Anna both mentioned, and, and I feel strongly about this, that there needs to be a relationship between industry and the unions and government and then the, the end customers, as well as us as a technology provider, that there needs to be a relationship. Um, and that's one of the things that is changing quickly, is building those bridges in between um, industry and, and academia to uh, to focus on this challenge that we have because it is a big challenge. Yeah, it, it's an enormous challenge, and all of those stakeholders have to be involved. But in some sense, it has to start much earlier. Than that. It has to start in the educational system. You know, a lot of people my age talk about when we went to school, there were hands-on classes shop class, you had to actually build something. That's all gone from schools today. And so one of the most popular things in terms of robotics is the first robotics program. You know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, students participate in this outside of school. It's an after school activity. How do you build at an early age people's technical skills at some level starting early so that they're, um, you know, fully acquainted with the opportunities that exist and that they're getting the kinds of educational 
opportunities to learn. So that's one area that needs to be looked at, at least in the United States, more closely. The second thing is, and this goes to the technology providers, we have to make it easier. Anna was talking about courses and Felix was talking about courses and training and going and reading books and doing all these things. But there's new technologies out, whether they're augmented reality, virtual reality, that allow people with minimal skills to put on headsets, learn how to do some operation. It tells you if you did it right. That would speed up the, the skilling, the upskilling of people. And a lot of this technology is available now. When you talk about people being left behind, okay, this is a personal issue for me. I have no technical background. I've been working in robotics since 1983. I have no technical background at all. Yet, I add some value to this industry, I hope, because there are lots of ways that people can be involved in an increasingly automated world. It can be in design. It can be in communications. It can be in marketing. It can be in product development. We need to make sure that there's a home for everybody, including people like me with no technical background. So while we have to focus on science, technology, engineering, and math, we can't forget the arts either. This industry, if it's going to fully take advantage of all the people out there who can contribute, needs to be a big tent. And, and I think we can do that. Look five to 10 years into the future. Paint me a picture of how the factory of the future will look in your opinion. I feel like in an ideal world, you would have systems where you still have obviously inbuilt human oversight, which is a key demand that we have at least when it comes to any digital implementation in any sector. If you have that secured so that you have this human oversight, it obviously creates as Somebody already mentioned enough tasks for people to go after and to take care of. So with that in mind, then you would also have uh, augmented reality, virtual reality systems to support you in doing some of those tasks, whereas other workers will be able to manage uh, and oversee the, the processes, co-create, maybe innovate uh, on top of the systems that uh, their firms bought and introduced maybe innovate, co-create based on that and add on different innovations, et cetera. I feel like that's the ideal picture. I'm not saying this is what's going to happen because what, uh, what my fear would be, especially in regards to the current economic situation and uh, the couple of years that we had ahead of us that are economically very tense, uh, very severe, is that some firms in an uncontrolled environment, especially where unions, I have to say, are not involved, will go ahead and try to automate faster to save labor costs in their thinking um, to, to save their own budgets. But whereas in reality, all studies that we see show that if you automate too fast and you get rid of workers, you do not necessarily uh, enhance your productivity or the quality of your product. I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, and um... Yes, as Anna said, uh, it's also important that um, companies uh, um, are clear about um, the fact that um, the workers they have are in fact assets. And uh, the, if they overlook it, I, I, I expect that such firms will be punished in the future, in particular in the industrialized world, where the dom demography, uh, um, well, um, is quite obvious. It's going down. So if you do not keep your your workers, then 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 you will lose out. That's I what I think. So so Jeff, how how do companies? remain attractive in the factory of the future in five to ten years and provide attractive work places uh, as related yet now by Anna and Felix because uh, we're not there well, yet. Well, first of all, let me say that the robots are tools to help the people. The people are first. That has to always be the situation. The second thing is we have um, sort of a blueprint of what happened during the Great Recession of 2008-2009. When we came out of that Great Recession, 
the world started automating with robotics in ways we had never seen before. It skyrocketed. And what happened to employment during that period? It skyrocketed. In the United States, we got to a point where unemployment uh, was so low that there were more open jobs than there were people looking for work. Now, the technology has changed the type of jobs, but in many cases, it's changed it for the better. So when you talk about the factory in five to 10 years, what you are going to see is people doing less labor intensive repetitive work, I think, overseeing machines likely, but oftentimes these are better, safer and higher paying jobs, jobs that people really should be doing. And we've seen this over the history of robotics. We used to have people working in paint booths. We took those people out of those terrible environments and put robots in there and all sorts of applications. And the challenge is obviously to upskill the workers so that they can do those jobs. But as these companies become more competitive over the past decade by using automation, employment grew because the companies were more successful. I think everybody's recognized that people and actual workers are very important. I mean, even the room I'm sitting in today um, isn't for robots, it's for people. Uh, it's to teach people how to use these machines. Um, and I think Jeff put it very well is, is that um, manufacturing is changing um, and the jobs that are available in manufacturing are going to be different. And so for us I, and me, I think that the factory of the future is one where there are less repetitive tasks done by people, um, but that doesn't mean there's less people. Um, it does mean probably that we can make more things um, with the same amount of people, or maybe we can make much, much, many, many more things um, with uh, fewer people uh, doing those dirt, dull, dirty, and dangerous jobs. Are there countries that are better prepared than others where where should we look to to look for something that others can learn from? Um, we've got many countries here represented here, lots of experience. Um, where are the best practices in the world? In, in fact, uh, the main elements uh, um, Anna already uh, named the main elements for a for a good cooperation for education and training of people. So if you have that in place. Uh, you are, as a country, you are all, already well placed. But for that, you also need um, a real social partner cooperation. This is what we can see from a European perspective, where in countries where the social partner relationships are still uh, conflictual, potentially conflictual, let's say in heritage of the past, I hope, uh, it does not work so well. I'm Jeff, you were spoke. Yeah. Anna. Go ahead, Anna. Of course. But especially, I mean, just to give you more concrete examples where you have negotiated agreements, for example, on less working time for training. Uh, concrete examples in the manufacturing industry in Germany, for example. You have the example, it's uh, extremely famous, and I'm sure you all heard about it by now, of the Swedish Job Security Councils, which uh, are sectorial bodies um, managed by only by social partners so governments are not involved it's there is a regulation that uh, manages that sort of upheld upholds these systems but governments are not involved and these councils in um, the event of layoffs or restructuring provide not only training and a network for re-employability re but they also provide career guidance and I think this is something that we haven't talked about because career guidance obviously doesn't yeah, need to be career guidance for the unemployed. It also can be career guidance for the employee to know wh what they should reskill and upskill for. And here you have a lot of trade union or social partners activities as well, where they act as mentors, where they act as uh, the providers of career guidance, or where they could act as union rep learning representatives, such as in the UK that achieve great results, for example, to bring lower skilled workers into upskilling activities. They have great numbers that speak for themselves, for example, where you have actively union representatives going in at the firm level, doing interviews, doing sourcing, and then uh, 
negotiate uh, with the employers to then free up those workers to get the skills that the employer would also benefit from. And I think that's precisely important to, to encourage more countries, more systems to go in this direction to build a sort of a nexus, a supportive ex nexus to enable this sort of training uptake. But I also think that there are systems in countries, especially in Asia, I'm thinking of Japan, where the acceptability of the introduction of some of these technologies is much higher, so that the tradition to upskill and work alongside those systems is much more enshrined in societies, so that um, it, it comes much more natural than, let's say, in, in other countries. I'm not saying that this is the ideal, but it's still there is a major difference between these types of systems and uh, others that are more say traditional in a sense. I'd like to bring Jeff and Mike in with their best practices here um, since we do have a world view here present. Um, if you could give, give us just briefly where you think the best practices you've seen are. Well, I mean, there was so much great information that was just shared right there about, you know, things going on in other countries. There are many great things going on in the United States, but not often connected not often at scale. For instance, the state of Ohio working with an organization called Ramtech. Ramtech working in a community in Ohio with major employers like Whirlpool and Honda who had very specific needs of skilled people. Ramtech trained these people and you know hundreds of people, everybody they trained got jobs in local employers and they couldn't satisfy the need. State of Ohio put in something like $40 million. Very successful program, but too slow, not spread throughout the country. And so we see coal miners being retrained to do jobs that would be in manufacturing. Uh, I think Rockwell it is, is training uh, former military uh, soldiers to come in and do some of these jobs. All great programs, not at scale. But the thing I wanted to comment on was what Anna said about the receptivity to working in automation and manufacturing and how some countries, uh, particularly in Asia, Japan embraced robotics technology early on, South Korea. I travel the world, you go to trade shows in those countries, there are children, small children in there playing with the technology. In the United States, you don't see that because of uh, insurance rules. It would be dangerous to put uh, the equipment around uh, little kids. but. There's a culture that says these technologies are good. They're not the terminator. They're not our enemy. They're our friend. We need to work with them. And so I think that's a, a big issue in terms of driving demand. You can have all the training programs you want. You still have to have people who want to go into them, who want to go into manufacturing fields. And so all of us are doing our best in the US and other places in the world to describe the uh, how clean factories are and how great these jobs are compared to jobs in the past. But what happens, this first robotics program that I mentioned earlier that hundreds of thousands of students participate in, when they graduate high school and college, they don't go into robotics. They go into fields that, you know, engineering and computer science and other fields that maybe pay higher. Maybe they go to work for Google or Apple or something like that. We have to keep them involved in manufacturing type fields. And uh, it's a difficult challenge. But, you know, working uh, as best we can to try and present this as a great future career opportunity. Uh, we, just, we just started participating in a program with the government, with the Department of Labor in the United States on a program called IRAP, which stands for Industry Recognized Apprenticeship Programs. And so what the government recognized was is that they didn't know uh, you know, maybe Felix, maybe some of your first comments was is that you're not you don't know too much about in robots and automation. And, I, and our government took a similar approach, not just with robots and automation, but lots of fields that um, the government wants to uh, work hard to, to do this, that they see the need of apprenticeship programs, but uh, they don't know about the technology themselves. And so they created this industry recognized apprenticeship program and then started to work with lots of companies like ourselves and another big controls company called Rockwell Automation. And we got nominated to be what's called an SRE, a standards recognition entity. 
And so we're the ones that tell the industry what it takes. So we take some like some of the robots behind me and we're the experts to say that to train a worker, you need to have this skill, this skill, this skill, and this skill. And then that that is what gets then placed. And so the government utilizes us to determine what skills are needed and then they sponsor those those um, apprenticeships or work with the end customers. Okay, I'd like to wrap up the discussion. Thank you to to all four of you, to Jeff, to Anna, to Mike, and to Felix. Um, and also thanks, thank you to the Messe Munich for organizing the talk today. Um, as we announced at the beginning, the Automatica Sprint will take place in Munich from June 22nd to 24th. So we look forward to seeing you there. Stay safe until then. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.